Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Chris Tarczewski, the principal at Dudley Middle School here, co-host of Unlock the Middle, where we go ahead and talk about all things that are middle-level education to help others identify what is great in their instructional game and the instructional game in their colleagues, helping to take one another to the next level. Alongside me is my good friend and co-host, Dean Backer, the principal at Charlton Middle School. Today on Friday, we are having our segment called Navigating Leadership, and we've got a couple of great guests with us. We're going to be talking today a little bit about self-care in leaders. So uh, before we get there, Dean, how are you doing on this Friday afternoon? Chris, fantastic. Thank you very much. Great lead-in. You get better every time we come on, man. You don't even have to look at the script anymore. You're getting so good. <laughs> hey, during this yeah. whole process of navigating leadership, if you could, in, in the beginning, if you could give a shout out who you are, where you're from, we'd love to just kind of banter back and forth with you a little bit, just to see some of the people that might be watching out there today. Uh, this, this viewpoint of our show is about bringing leaders together and to be able to experience an opportunity to hear um, through their lens, what they're seeing, what they're doing in their schools. And that's what makes navigating leadership so much fun, Chris. So, hey, happy Friday to you. I love Fridays. I love Sundays. I love Tuesdays. It's what we do. It's all about just getting better together. Hey, you know what it is? And, you know, the other days of the week, though, uh, that's what is about self-care and taking care of self. And we're <laughs> going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, you know, the outfits today, today was a little bit of a spirit day at DMS and at CMS um, because we've got our cohort B kids who are in the building today. So we had our uh, holiday sweater slash ugly sweater contest. I figured I'd up the game with a, uh, a suit <laughs> uh, that certainly won the ugly award uh, for the day. But, uh, you know, part of the, part of the uh, idea of taking care of yourself is about being real and, uh, you know, with your colleagues and with your stakeholders that you work with and, and letting them know a little bit about who you are as a person and how you unload some of the stresses of the day to day. And that is something that we really want to get into, especially at this time of the year, Dean. Well, you know, principals, just like teachers, we are we are real people. And, and again, I know that we are put on a pedestal at times when kids look up to us what we are, but we put our pants on one leg at a time. And when we come into school, we want them to know that we have to take those steps just like they do in order to grow each and every day. So dressing down with an ugly sweater, a hat, whatever, that's all par for the course. And that, that's what makes our job so much fun. So why don't we dig in a little bit here, Chris, if we can. And let's bring in Stacy and Brandon. We're both with us today to discuss a topic that I think is important, and that's self-care. So why don't we bring them both in? We'll do a quick introduction and go from there. How's that sound? Sounds good, brother. I'll go ahead and uh, bring Stacy in. You can introduce her. How's that? Absolutely. All right. I guarantee she's going to be wearing a hat. You bringing her in? Yeah, I got her right there. Yeah, bam, she she is. Bam. All right. Hey, Stacy. Welcome Hello. to our show. Uh, Stacy is the principal of a pre-K to seven building in Stockton, Kansas. So welcome to our show, Stacy. Thanks for taking time out to be with us today. Thanks for the invite. I'm excited to be with you. Awesome. Good. And I love the hat and I love the outfits. Good <laughs> stuff. All right, Chris, I'm going to bring in Brandon. Why don't you take it from there? All right. That's cool. Here we go. Hey, this is Brandon Wallace. He's a K-12 principal in Chill Hour, our force, Adalia, Missouri. Uh, how Missouri. Did I get that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How are you, Brandon? It's in a Chill Howie, Missouri. So, Chill Howie. Yeah. I'm at a small you know what that is on the map, Chris? If you could tell me right now, I'm going to give you anything you need for the rest of the day. Me too. That, that'd be amazing. <laughs> hey, you know what? It is the show me state, but I will wait to go ahead and show you in a little while once I pull it up on my atlas. <laughs> hey, welcome to both of you guys. We appreciate it. Chris and I started this platform a while ago as just an opportunity for us to be able to connect with other leaders across the country and just share the stories that make our jobs, you know, so, so delightful and so challenging at times. So that's why the platform is set up. So why don't you do a quick introduction? Stacy? why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from, and then we'll move over to Brandon after that. Sure. Stacy Green. I'm a pre-K-7 principal, as you mentioned, in Stockton, Kansas, um, small rural school in the northwest part of the state. This is actually my 31st year here, eighth year as the principal, and we've got the best kids around and we're having fun today. I've been called a leprechaun, and then one of my fifth graders also said, you expect us to take you seriously today. So like you said in the beginning, it's all about bringing some fun and laughter into the, the hard work that we do. I love it. Good stuff. Awesome. Brandon, throw it over to you. <laughs> yeah, my name is Brandon Wallace. I'm a K-12 principal in Chilhowee, Missouri. We're a small rural school. Uh, we have about 179 kids total, K-12. Uh, this wow. is my 10th year. 
uh, as a principal and my first year, like I said, in Chill Howie. And uh, I'm not sure my wife would let me wear that outfit in the car on the way home. So uh, for safety reasons, I decided not to go that far. So it's all good. Hard to explain if you get pulled over. I, I'm sure one way or another. Um, yeah. Hey, listen, great. Great to have both of you guys on today. So we got the topic of self-care from a principal's lens. Um, Chris, why don't you just start us off? Some of the things in your school that you do for yourself to ensure that you are balanced during this time. And I'm talking about, you know, we're navigating COVID, we're navigating multiple different schedules, we're navigating scenarios that just arise on the minute sometimes as we got, try to get through this to provide a platform for kids. So let's go around the room and talk a little bit about what, what goes on in our schools. Sure. I mean, I think in terms of self-care, for me, it's important about maintaining as close to a, a reasonable balance as possible. Um, you know, as a as a dad uh, with a wife who's an educator and three kids, a junior, a seventh grader actually in my building. She loved the suit, by the way, not at all. Uh, and a fourth grade son uh, who's coming into this building next year as a fifth grader. Um, it's very hard to disconnect. Uh, from work because uh, it's a it's a continuous cycle, um, and and by cycle I mean I'm in the building with my family, I'm home with my family, I'm working with the educators on a daily basis, uh, and you know it's it's really difficult to shut it down um, in terms of talking about education constantly. You know, uh, Mrs. Starr is a, a middle school educator, um, so we're constantly caught in the, in the wheel of education and. Uh, for me, it's it's much more about finding that personal balance and, and taking different types of rest. Uh, and and I'll, I'll go into those in a little while. But in terms of the school itself, I mean, this is an example of something. We have to go ahead and keep it real. We have to keep it uh, uh, light, uh, but serious. We're always going to be hard on the issues, but soft on the people. Uh, you know, we've got non-negotiable expectations with kids, but we don't want to point them, uh, paint them into a corner uh, because they may have stepped over a line. We want to go ahead and be sensitive to the situation and circumstances, especially in this environment of COVID, because I guarantee you our attendance expectations are not anything close to what they used to be. Our levels of participation expectations aren't anything close to what they expected to be, you know, prior to our closure. So um, being real and, and hard on the issues, but soft on the people is one of the most important uh, entries into self-care that I can think of. Stacy. So interestingly enough, uh, this is our fourth year in a redesign program through the Kansas State Department of Education. And through that time, we um, found out how important self-care was. We were researching and redesigning our schools and going all in with dumping everything out and starting over. So during that time, we saw a lot of staff not taking care of themselves. So I've said all the way through, COVID's been hard, this pandemic's been hard, but we'd had a preface to that. So we'd learned to take care of ourselves that I think has made us pretty successful. But for me, um, again, small town, I'm surrounded, like you said, Chris, with this all day long. It's hard to leave my role here and, and go out in community and be someone different than who I am as a principal, which I love, but it can also be hard. So for me, it's really about the biggest thing lately in the last couple of years is I stop and have my lunch. There had been times before that where I did not eat all day and then I'm good for no one. So um, stopping for a meal during the day is important. Um, I try to do my very best to exercise daily and that's important to keep me um, physically and mentally ready to go for my, my days here at school. And then I'm up and going all day while I'm at school as well. I'm, I'm very much out in the classroom, active principal. And I think that that's what I need um, to keep me um, mentally and, and physically in a place to be best for everyone else. So those are my three go-tos. I'd say sleep. Um, no matter what I seem to do and tweak, that one doesn't come as easily. Um, so <laughs> I assume that is something I try to do anymore. <laughs> I don't know. What is sleep? I forgot what that is. I, mean, I know it's something important. Um, nevertheless, Brandon, you're up. Yeah, kind of same situation. Uh, the only difference is the fact that this is my first year inside of my building. So not only are we dealing with the COVID year, but I'm learning about new people. And I came from a district where I was there for about eight years. So I had a pretty good idea who my staff was, what they were about. So this has been a definite challenge. So uh, a friend of mine, uh, Howard Fields, I believe he's assistant soup in Kearney, Missouri. I was listening to one of his messages he gave out not too long ago. And he said that as leaders, we need to create safe spaces, uh, safe spaces for our staff, safe spaces for ourselves. And while we feel like, you know, we have a connection with our staff and have those maybe light, easy, quick conversations, we need to be intentional about creating opportunities where they can truly just let down, let go of their guard and just let it out. 
And so uh, my school district, my leadership group has uh, really been intentional about creating those opportunities where teachers can just sit and be and be in their own space and just let it out with no judgment. Um, a lot of times they don't even want us to fix anything, just an opportunity just to speak and get it out, verbalize it out. And we, we tend to find out that just is a lot of weight off their shoulders. Mm. And, you know, yeah. I think that's really, really interesting. All of you took a piece of what I was thinking in my head here. So if I just kind of go back and look at my building, giving teachers the opportunity to be who they are and feel safe and feel comfortable. Absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a prerequisite. It needs to be happening. But I also have to look the part myself. I've got to make sure that uh, I'm there early. I'm available. I am transparent. You can find me. Uh, you can come see me whenever you want. Um, because they need to come. You know, I need to be that conduit for them to be able to hold conversations and just to get things off their minds. You're absolutely correct. And it's okay. And it's okay not to be perfect during COVID. That is absolutely uh, essential to know because you're not going to be perfect. None of us are. Uh, nothing is perfect about the world that we live in today. But to know that you've got support from the administrative lens down, it's a win-win. It's family first. I say it all the time. Your family needs to be balanced. You need to make sure you're taking care of that. And if you do that, from a perspective of a professional workplace, good things generally happen and, and, and people realize that they're connected if that is the case. Yeah, you know, earlier today, I was uh, before school uh, this morning, I was scrolling through Facebook and uh, social media, it can be a bad thing, but it can also be a good thing. What I've got is I've got some things set up where I've got the things I pay attention to. What I pay attention to are the positive messages. Mm -hmm. um, I usually don't pay attention to the the community gossip. I usually don't pay attention to well, certainly nothing about the schools, um, but I came, came across something this morning on the We Are Teachers site, and it matches into what we're talking about today perfectly. They talked about the seven types of rest, and I liked it because I had to. I stopped at the title, and I was like, seven types of rest? How the heck can anybody list out seven different types? I can think of seven things, right, that I could do for rest, but they broke them down to physical rest, mental, emotional, social, creative, spiritual, and sensory. And I started thinking about those categories and I was like, all right, yeah, physical, yeah, re relaxation and sleep. Okay, yeah, working out. Um, mental, uh, yeah, maybe the meditation or listening to some good tunes, you know, to, to decompress with. Um, but then I started thinking about the emotional and the social and the creative and the spiritual and the sensory. I had a little bit of a more challenging time identifying how, those allow for rest. Um, so, you know, just in terms of those categories, you know, we, everybody hit upon some of those. Um, but as I was thinking about that post, um, as we were talking, just the, the different categories and the ways that we can all take care of ourselves in order to take care of others and how important that is. Um, flight attendants get it all the time. Put your, put your oxygen mask off before helping your child. Um, we have to, we have to do that. Yeah, and I'm pretty fortunate to come from a school district that where uh, our leadership team is very faith-based, and that's very important to myself and my family. And I know when you get into public education, you even speak about faith, people tend to cringe and you know want to crawl into a corner. But we're, we're very open and very honest about that. And so as a leadership team, uh, we're always good about either praying with each other or for each other. And especially with the group that I have around me, other leaders and other districts, uh, we're very open to the fact that that is a safety net for us. So we get to that point where we feel like we've hit rock bottom. We go back to that. And we're very honest and open about uh, how we feel about each other in a spiritual sense. And I tell you that that is incredibly uplifting for our group, especially. You know, Brandon, one of the things during tough times is regardless of what your faith is, to, be, yeah. to have a faith, to believe in something. Right. And, and, you know, when I find our society today is more defragmented in that aspect of things, which leads to a lot of, you know, uncertainty and, and it's hard and and again in public schools yeah you're right they, they do cringe when you start talking about religion and things of that nature but at the end of the day i do think that you know in times of crisis generally most people do go back to some sort of faith and that's important it's important to keep you stable exactly so let's let's take a look for a second just about from the kids standpoint you know we talked about ourselves what are you doing in your schools to keep your kids balanced and safe and, and and getting them balanced out what, what are you doing let's go let's start off with brandon on with this one uh definitely creating a space to where uh they know they're loved and taken care of uh our our free and reduce rate our poverty rate is pretty high um and our kids we mainly come from backgrounds or like i use the word fragmented i think i heard that earlier and that's exactly correct and so we make sure that um i am outside on that sidewalk every single morning 
uh, greeting those kids as they come in. So I'm the first face and voice that they hear. And it's every, I try to be up, up, as upbeat as possible, even when it's snowing and it's raining and it's chilled outside. But yeah, I want to set a tone. I want to let them know that we're going to have a good day. I'm going to be there for you every single uh, step of the way. Awesome. Stacy. Similar to that. And then we've added another layer. We do school-wide zones of regulation. So mm -hmm. checking in with students on where they are in any particular day and letting them know that regardless of where they are, it's okay. It's okay to be in that red zone. Um, getting them an opportunity to find someone, a trusted adult in the building that they can speak with, spend some time with. Um, we always know the social emotional needs come first before the academic need. And we are focused on that um, for all kids in our building. And that goes a long way. And what I found this year is I've had kids acting out or that dysregulation. Oftentimes when you sit down and, and try to work them through that, they don't know how to name this. They know that something doesn't feel right. They know that this is not their norm, but they honestly can't label what it is about um, this time and this place and that uncertainty of each time we take a break will we come back and be in person again. So really just leaning into every single relationship. And if it's not me, finding that adult who it is that they can they, they can speak to and be comfortable with and, and open up to. Stacy, can you dig a little deeper with, for us and just talk about the school-wide zones of regulation? What does that look like in your school? I mean, we don't do that specifically, but I love how that sounds. And I know that we have it within embedded within our some of our programs. But uh, what does that look like from a school-wide perspective? And actually, it's a district-wide. We use that in our high school, 812 as well. And we trained all staff. And we have lessons that we go through and use the zones of regulation lessons. It's printed up throughout our building using our tiger mascot. I glanced over here. It's just a, a part of our check-in. Some teachers do a verbal check-in when kids come to the door um, morning and again mid-afternoon. Sometimes it's a Google check-in, but we just use that common language um, and describe it. I did an activity a few weeks ago with sixth and seventh graders, um, a letter that starts with T. What does that look like in the blue zone, the yellow zone, the green zone, at either a, an emotion, a feeling, or maybe a coping strategy. So we just try to embed it in our everyday language. And that came again through that redesign process of, of being truly socially, emotionally prepared to take on the academic part of our life. Yeah. I love that redesign. Yeah. yeah, that's that's awesome. And I, I think she's exactly right when she said earlier about her kids not being able to express how they feel. I don't know how I can expect a, a kindergartner or a first grader or second grader to verbalize how they feel on a regular basis, especially when they're when they're totally dysregulated. But if they can point to a, a green, yellow, red, or if they can at least point to an emotional face that we have drawn on something, that at least gives us a lead into where we go from there. And then, like Stacy said, provide them with the tools how then to start expressing how they feel. Then we can start working together. But sometimes they just need to be and just need to be wherever and just work to get that out. At least they know we're close and we're there to help and support. So I love Stacy's doing that. That's outstanding. And I'm going to circle back for a second, Brandon, and just talk about being that first face that everybody sees. I'm guilty as charged. I am out there as well in yeah. the freezing cold weather trying to say hello, wave to every parent, set the tone for what we think is going to be that welcoming and open, you know, climate of learning. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complete learning community. And we want people, we want kids to know that we are here for every step that they take and parents as well. And the only way by doing that is being visible and being right out in front of it. So great, great stuff. Chris? Yeah. You know, the more and more I listen, yeah, I'm out there every morning too. I, I think we, we all to, to some degree have that visible you know, component to the relationship. But I think one of the most challenging things this year uh, has been um, our families that are new to the school. You know, we've got a transition grade, our fifth grade. And uh, just recently, I, we had to relocate a classroom in the building, right? Because a student became ill upstairs. We relocated this fifth grade class to the library. And this little fifth grade girl looked at me when I got them all set in there with the classroom teacher. And she said, I need a hug. And I said, why are you okay, honey? She said, yeah, I'm just so happy right now because I've never been in the library. Oh. <laughs> and in the school, and, and she'd been here since middle of September, and it was the very beginning of December. Awesome. It was heartbreaking because, you know, we've got the kids in one classroom environment. So I guess where I'm going with this is that we've got a tremendous reputation on putting the needs of kids first and the needs of families first and the needs of educators first. That's our reputation. Yep. But the reality is that everybody who's new to our building doesn't understand our reputation because they haven't yet experienced it. So we have to earn their respect. We have to earn their acknowledgement of that reputation. Mm -hmm. And that is something that's been exceptionally hard to do this year because of 
the limited in, engagement that we have with kids. You know, we see half the kids on Monday, Tuesday, the other half on Thursday, Friday. They don't travel from classroom to classroom. They don't get to engage with administration and counseling in the cafeteria or during recess. They don't get to visit the gymnasium or the auditorium or the band room or the, the STEM lab. Um, all those pieces about what makes this school special, we just aren't able to get to that. But what we do have is a very strong commitment for every educator in the building to know every child. Mm -hmm. And and that is in some ways a back-breaking effort because the teachers can't do it the way that they were used to doing it. Mm -hmm. And they 100% used to be our benchmark. 80% is our new 100%, right? But they're not satisfied. That's not good enough. So now the educators are putting in more and more work to go above and beyond what the benchmark should be. And it's taken a toll. And recently things have gotten a little bit better, a little bit lighter, but at, there, there's a significant human cost associated to that additional effort. And um, that, that's why this idea of self-care is so, so important. Um, acknowledging that our reputation can only carry us so far and the experience needs to build our reputation moving on. Hey, it's great to see Bobby and Ray check in as well. So yeah, I saw that. It's always, you know, that's that's why we do what we do. It's about networking and building that bridge together because we're all in this together. Hey, let's spin this backwards for a second and not talk about us as leaders or our teachers or our kids. What are you doing for families out there that are really suffering and they're really hurting? You know, we've got kids who become disengaged with the learning process because the parents can't be there to support them. I don't know what your district is right now as, it, as the learning platform states, if you're full remote or if you're hybrid, or if you're full in, but I can tell you we're a blend. And being a blend is, is so hard. I was on with three or four different kids today, just trying to get them to a mindset that gets them to connect to the learning and let them know how much we care because they're not, they're not here to see their teachers. So they need that, that boost in order to move forward. Let's talk about what that looks like and how to support families. And let's go over to Stacy first. Okay. We are fully in person, but we do have several students out on um, remote due to family quarantines. We've had some times where we've been as high as 86 in the building, which is roughly a third of our students um, away to some kind of modified quarantine or quarantine. And then we're down to a, a small amount now. But one of the things I found is meet that family where they is where they are. I try to do the porch drop off. So if I'm dropping off um, either meals or student materials or the Chromebooks initial or iPads, whatever, just a tap at the door and a step back and check in with them um, visually. And then honestly, the other day, um, this is perfect timing. I had a mom and just unload on one of our staff members. She's got three kids at home. They've been home about 20 days due to just, just situations. And she was done. And she was like, I don't know how you do this. I can't do it anymore. I'm, you know, I'm just finished. The teachers are contacting me every day. So my teacher found me. I picked up the phone and called that mom and said, breathe, be done. You need to be mom. You need to take care of yourself. You're a post-COVID patient. You need to put the work away. We will meet them where they are when they come back here in January. I'm going to stop you for a second. Meet them where they are. If we can take something to pull away from this conversation, every educator that's listening, anybody out there, parent, meet the kids where they are. Sorry, Stacey. Go back. I did great. And then I just reminded her, I said, we're going to give you grace. Please give my teachers yeah. grace, too. They're stressed out. They are doing what they're asked to do by me and by our state department that we are making daily contact. So for you, it's feeling like this. For them, it's feeling like this. But then I sent the, actually I didn't, my staff member sent the email out and said, everybody just, we're done. We've checked in. We know we've checked in. We're going to document that. Let that family be that family. The cool thing was later that afternoon, we had a picture from mom. All three kids were sitting on the couch with their devices, just content to be working. Because I think she was allowed to not do it. And I think that lessened the stress in the home. And then they were ready to work again. So yeah, we're learning all kinds of things about ourselves and each other during this time. But I hope we take this and move forward with it. That's what I've asked my staff as well. What is something that's happened through last spring and this semester that we do not want to go back to that the pandemic has taught us? And over and over again, it's care for each other in the building and it's the family relationships that we've built during this time. Spot on. Yeah. Spot on. Brandon? Yeah, yeah I, I think Stacy used a word that has been part of our motto and that is grace. And that's grace we show each other as staff members on our leadership team and also grace to our parents and to our students. So you're right. I, I think one of the benefits of this pandemic is the fact that it's taught us as instructors that some of the things we do may not be as important as we thought it was. So that narrowing effect to truly what we get to the meat of what we're trying to do 
uh, it has really just solidified our relationships with our parents and with our students. We are in person as well. Uh, I think we have maybe a handful of kids are on quarantine just due to adult uh, positive tests. Uh, other than that, we are in the building as much as we can. And uh, we're extending that grace by modeling that for each other as much as we can. If we have a kid stressed out coming in and saying, I just can't keep up, you know what? We're going to stop, slow down, uh, take a moment, and we're just going to just be kids. And then we're just going to regroup and then go back to it. Uh, every Wednesday, I put out a Wallace Wednesday through YouTube, and it's connected to our Facebook and to our Thrill Share page. And um, it just gives me a chance just to kind of talk about the week at school, some different things. And I also get to be somewhat vulnerable in the fact of I'm struggling with this. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble with this. So I hope you can relate to it. So please show me grace as I'm trying to be as great as a family member in our community as possible. So once again, we're there for each other. And a lot of the feedback I've gotten is, is yes, I, I hear that. I get that. I'm in the same boat. Thank you for saying it because we weren't sure we could say it because we didn't want to seem like we couldn't handle things. You know, one of the things that, um, you know, I'm thinking about here, we've got the same messages, you know, permission to moms and dads, caregivers, yeah. set it aside. Let us worry about the things you're, you're not an educator. We get it. We just need your help with X, Y, and Z. And at a bare minimum, um, I think one of the great things about this learning community here is that we, we really do have a focus on compassion, care, and kindness. And, um, you know, tremendous community service initiatives uh, where we, we reach out and we support our local families, you know, anywhere from student led initiatives like, you know, holiday toy collections to be able to donate to the pediatric unit at University of Massachusetts Medical Center. Um, we've got a great connection with a, an organization called U Inc. Um, this year we were able to provide through the greater Dudley uh, Webster Charlton community. You know, over 300 kids who are being provided with a $50 gift card um, to, uh, you know, Walmart, Target, you know, someplace like that. So they can, their parents, it's for their parents, really, but it's for the kiddo. Holiday time. Can't afford it? Let's go ahead and get you something to make it special. We get some great benefactors who help us reach out to families who are in need. You know, everything from the Thanksgiving turkey to all the fixings to delivering the meals on a Wednesday afternoon if the parents can't get out of the house to be able to come up and get the meals provided by our food services. We've got volunteers from our educational community who go out to do that. Um, and, and I think that is where we really build that flywheel effect of community and uh, community generated activism. Because what we want to do is really model for our kids how to be great humans. And ultimately at the end of the day, as a former math teacher, this, this might not make sense, but if the kid can't solve that two-step equation, uh, but they can relate to others in a positive way and affect positive change, we can teach them how to do the, the equations, yeah. equation work later on, yeah. you know, because we have to have an entry point with them. We have to have an in with them. And that's, that's that humanistic connection. And I think that's something that we do exceptionally well uh, here in, in, the, uh, in our district. Well, the two words that I come to my mind is empathy and compassion. And if you yeah. can teach kids at an age between 10 and 14 to embrace both of those words, and not only embrace it, but put it into their everyday lives in some capacity, the world's a better place. Yeah. We, all, we all become better because of that. And, you know, if I could keep those two words as my words of the week moving forward for the rest of the school year, I think maybe I should instead of trying to build a deeper vocabulary. Because right now, that's probably needed more than any other time. And, and Chris, your school does a wonderful job at reaching out through those organizations. And we do the same thing, probably not on the same scale. But at the end of the day, it's about making those connections within the community. So, you know, as we as we come around full circle right here, let's just talk about, and we kind of wrap this up a little bit, things that we're, ha we're really thankful for. You know, we're going into a holiday. Um, you know, we've worked hard. Um, I'm going to start off, and, and quite frankly, I'm thankful for my staff, who's been absolutely incredible. You know, I've asked them to do things that put them out of their comfort zone. They deliver. I've had tough conversations with parents, and they've been open-minded to listen and to meet me somewhere along the journey. I've had tough conversations with kids. I'm thankful for the community that I live in. I'm thankful for the job that I have and for the ability to connect with kids and people every day to empower them and make them better. Chris? Wow. I think that, um, yeah, ditto. Um, well, you can't uh, say you ditto here, yeah, man. You got, it's, you're, on, you're on the floor now. Let's go. Rats. I, I think one of, one of the most important in, uh, elements of, of thankfulness is, is, you know, 
family is a given. Um, but I think that um, you know, here in Massachusetts in 2010, Governor Deval Patrick at his inauguration, he installed a project called uh, Project 351. And uh, we have 351 cities and towns here in, uh, in, the, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The idea was to help develop and cultivate young, unsung heroes as leaders in their local community and to be able to identify um, kids who can go out and affect positive change and help really shape the future. And one of the things that I'm most uh, thankful for and grateful for is the level of student leadership and student initiative that we have in our local communities, um, beyond the classroom, beyond the athletic field, beyond the performing arts programs, which are nationally award-winning. I mean, all that stuff is great, but we have so many kids whose families support them in their dreams and their goals that we, we are going to be affecting positive change in the future. And it's, it's on their backs. It's at the ends of their fingertips that we are going to experience greatness and uh, being able to have a high level of hope and an understanding that um, my kids, like my two daughters and my son are a part of that momentum shift um, is just all the thanks I need, you know, as a parent, as an educator, it's all I want. Uh, I want them to have a great future and have control over it. And that's perhaps what I'm most thankful and grateful for at this point. Before we go to Stacy, Hans Oppel did uh, chime in. If you know Hans, he is a cultural <laughs> guru of affecting change within schools. So Hans, thanks very much for the kind words. Uh, absolutely. We were blessed to have you on the show with us and to be able to uh, sprinkle out there some of the great things you do in your school and your district. So thanks so much. Stacy, you're up. Sure. I'm going to go with my staff because, again, they've just I'm blessed beyond means that they have done the work that they've done and allowed me to come alongside them to do that. I'm going to take a little side road here. We live in a, a county where we have three districts and we have one hospital. And what we found, we started meeting in summer and we meet every Friday morning. And I am thankful for this group of educators. We have typically been competitive among each other in sports and other things and, and just being in the same county. But we have come together on behalf of our students and staff to keep everyone healthy and in person in school. And this morning we celebrated that by being able to say that, you know, post pandemic, we're going to keep meeting together for our county and pulling our resources together and doing everything we can to make the best education and support system for our school and community. People in Kansas competitive, the Jayhawks, I can't imagine that. Oh. For a <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. There you go. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Gotcha. All right, Brandon, you're up. Yeah, my, my friend to the side there, I just got to say M-I-Z, but that's all I got. I'm good after that. So it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful for people like Stacy and uh, the things that she does and the example that she shows that because that inspires me to keep pushing as hard as I can. I'm thankful to you guys for giving us a voice uh, as often as you do and a platform where we can get this stuff out. Because uh, sometimes, you know, I talk to the same wall every single day and he gets sick of hearing me. But able to get this out there and relate a little bit is awesome. Uh, also, kind of what Stacy was saying is that uh, we created a collaboration group of small school principals around us, leaders around us who speak the same language, who live the same life, who have the same struggles. And like Stacy said, uh, that has been a, a God blessing, saving grace for us because it gives us a chance to just be together and just uh, just common voice and get that out there. Um, really thankful for our community as well, who are very supportive of our school. And even when we screw up a whole lot, uh, <laughs> they show us grace and, and, and they're thankful that we have kids inside the building and loving on them and taking care of them every single day. Uh, and everything from our soup to our, our board and also my own family as well. My wife also works in education. Uh, she's a middle school counselor. So she brings that weight with her every single day. But just uh, to be intentional about our home is our safe place and to be able to let that go and unplug and just be a family. Um, and also for uh, the small group that I have at church of people who uh, uh, iron sharpens iron. And we're very intentional about that. And so uh, the different platforms I have around me that lift me up when I, I tend to stumble. So I'm grateful for all of it. And I'm grateful for the chance to be uh, walking the hallways with kids and with adults who want to do nothing but teach and love. So I'm very blessed in that. We go like this. That's right. Yeah. Welcome, you guys. You're right. That's why we do what we do. You know, Brandon and Stacy, thank you so much, really, for joining yeah. 
I mean, I, I love it. I, I, mean, I could continue this conversation forever because we're all rowing in the same direction. You know, the problem being is that we've got to get to a point where we can get back to normal. And what yeah. that normal is going to look like for all of us, we can't wait because we're going to be so darn good at it because we've worked through the toughest time in our life as school leaders uh, and as teachers and as educators and as parents and as students. So again, stay tight. we got to support one another and continue to move forward. Chris? Yeah, 100% spot on. Yeah, I had a meeting today with our student support team, which we call the SST. And one of the agenda items that kind of guided our conversation was, uh, you know, planning the return to normalcy. And it was all about not going back to what it was like, but anticipating all the challenges that we've had now in terms of how we need to be prepared for the new normal and how do we have to engage educators in that conversation and, and how do we have to provide new supports and structures um, for trauma-informed practices and, and all the wonderful um, things that we used to do. How do we deliver those in a newer environment? But anyway, that's a topic for a new day. Um, it's Friday afternoon, everybody, and it's been a heck of a week. Um, Stacy Brandon, thank you so much for joining us um, today. You know, we've got Kansas represented, we've got Missouri represented, we've got Massachusetts here with Dean and I. Um, tremendous experience talking with you. I'm glad you are now a member of our family uh, because we can reach out to you and ask some questions. Uh, you know, and, and just get a different lens on a problem. Uh, tremendous opportunity to build our PLN. Everybody out there and unlock the middle land. This was Friday afternoons, Navigating Leadership, episode number six. Our flagship show is coming at you live on Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Unlock the middle. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Facebook. Check us out on YouTube. Visit our website for the archive of all of our guests that we've had. To date, we've had a few. Uh, it's been a second full-time job, Chris. But a <laughs> full-time job that is so much fun, and it's not like working. No, absolutely. Well, hey, everybody. Work hard. Be better. Play hard this weekend. Rest and relax. And as always, just keep on chugging. Have a great one, everybody. Merry Christmas.